or IBM number. And every concentration camp had an IBM customer site called the Hollerith Department or the Hollerith Section. It was called Hollerith Abteilung. This number ultimately became tattooed on some people's forearms. That's correct. The Auschwitz number began as an IBM number. Remember, the IBM Hollerith system, or punch card system, was not just a, a, a way of keeping track of people. It could keep track of warehouses, of inventory, of transportation, of trains, of individuals, of groups, of payments. They used it for banks. It made the railroads run on time. Anything that could be quantified was quantified with IBM punch cards, and they had a worldwide global monopoly. This appealed dynamically to the Nazis because they wanted to control everything. The Nazis wanted to see everything, be aware of everything, have a totalitarian state, which means a totalitarian understanding and control of everything in the state. And so the Nazis came up with the idea that every single object in society would have a so-called talking number or a descriptive number. There'd be a long series of numbers. There'd be a specific number for a wristwatch. And then a wristwatch that had a gold band as opposed to a leather band would have a different number. And one which would have a crystal face would have yet another number. And another which had a, um, a, a buckle to it or a clasp those would have yet another number. And so you could get a perfect description of every product, of every substance, of every material, whether it was a cord of wood, whether it was a barrel of oil, or whether it was a train load of Jews, based on this descriptive number. This evolved after the war into the barcode. In the first years after World War II, this concept of numbering everything in existence caused us to develop the barcode, and there were many formulations for the barcode, but eventually the IBM formulation for the barcode won out. And this was quite simply something that, is, that has become ubiquitous. We can find it on every tube of toothpaste, we can find it on every boxcar, we can find it on every truck, we, we can find it on every battery, we can find it everywhere as a product identification code. Enter RFID. Radio Frequency Identification. This allows us to put a barcode in a tag on a sweater or a book. Radio Frequency Identification is an automatic data capture technology. It exists in the radio frequency or RF portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and it is used to uniquely identify products and objects. An RFID system consists of three components, an antenna and a transceiver which are often combined into one reader and a transponder. This is the tag being read. The antenna uses radio frequency waves to transmit a signal that activates the transponder. When activated, the tag transmits data back to the antenna. The data is then used to notify a programmable logic controller that an action should occur. The action could be as simple as raising an access gate or opening a toll booth, or as complicated as interfacing with a database to carry out a monetary transaction. RFID is coming into an increasing use in the world as an alternative to the barcode. The product embedded with an RFID tag is alive and it communicates throughout its entire life cycle. The longevity of the RFID tag itself extends past the life of the product. Currently, there are no regulations protecting consumers from the abuses of this technology. All the technologies which have the ability to advance mankind also have the ability to create a nightmare of repression. That which can warm us can also incinerate us. And this tracking capability is now being married to more than just tracking. It's being married to data mining. And so now, just as everybody has their own personal homepage on Amazon, you click it up, it knows who you are. It gives you recommended products based upon you and only you that are totally different from the next, from the next person who is loading up Amazon. They can now marry the information of an RFID tag with the individual, 
his likes, his dislikes, his problems in society, his threat to society, or can we say his perceived threat to society? Or can we say there is a society that might perceive him as a threat and they will use this RFID technology in the same way that they have used fingerprints and DNA and electronic surveillance and IBM Hollerith punch cards in the past for evil means and for evil ends. Now what are we talking about? We're talking about this. This is an injectable RFID chip funded by IBM to a company that does not resemble IBM, so IBM can ultimately have complete access to and take over this technology. And right here, let's not drop this, this is the injectable chip that is planned for patients, for dogs, for pets. In previous short films, we have investigated the use of implants in animals. We looked at the studies of Dr. Jose Delgado's research in the 1960s, where he implanted electrodes into the midbrain of a normally hostile bull. By means of a remote control, he used radio frequency to short circuit the rage signals, stopping the bull before it reached the matador. We have also looked at a similar study on cats, where the opposite was accomplished. Rage signals were created via radio frequency, causing the cats to attack. In another piece, we looked at the tracking of animals and raised the question, whose pet are you? But today, we are going to focus on the puppeteer and look at who is controlling the strings and what they have planned for the marionettes. On the 6th of July, 2009, a portly Scott Silverman, the CEO of Verichip Corp, the company who owns the patent for the human implantable RFID chip announced, Verichip Corporation supports legislation banning forced microchip implantation. And thus another agonizing act was completed in their clown, human implantable RFID rodeo show. Scott Silverman trumpeted. For years we as a company have enforced a strict privacy policy that starts with the voluntary use of our Veramed HealthLink patient identification system, which includes our implantable microchip, the Verichip. The primary application of our Veramed HealthLink patient identification system and the Verichip microchip is to identify high-risk patients and their medical records in an emergency or clinical situation. Scott Silverman continued, In general, we are supportive of legislation that prohibits forced implants. As long as legislators understand the primary application of Verichip and the benefits it can provide, we support, in fact we started, the voluntary nature of implantable RFID. Why would Verichip Corp. issue such a press release, we ponder? Having been dogged by civil libertarians, privacy advocate groups, and being the butt of hacking security flaws, the death nail was sounded when Dr. Katherine Albrecht released her research article, Microchip, Induced Tumors in Laboratory Rodents and Dogs, a review of the literature. This article showcased a causal link between implanted radio frequency, RFID microchip transponders, and cancer. Sharing in this study was Dr. Robert Ben Ezra, the Director of Cancer Biology Genetics Program of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He went on record to say, there's no way in the world, having read this information, that I would have one of those chips implanted in my skin or in one of my family members. Given the preliminary animal data, it looks to me that there's definitely cause for concern. Even to the average layperson, Verichip's devil's advocate position, taken with their press release supporting the microchipping legislation, sticks out like a sore thumb. It reeks of desperation, deceit, and sleight of hand as people from all corners of the globe reject the concept of human microchipping. The company has now attempted to eliminate their Achilles heel by distancing itself from mandatory human chipping. How grounded in truth is Scott Silverman's press release? Let us use semantics to testify to the press release's validity. The English Dictionary breaks down voluntary to mean done, made, brought about, undertaken, etc. of one's own accord or by free choice. 
acting or done without compulsion or obligation.